Welcome to this Gateway series, What Every Believer Should Know About Abortion. This is part one. Francis Schaeffer famously said in his book, Whatever Happened to the Human Race, people drift along from generation to generation and the morally unthinkable becomes thinkable. For centuries, Western culture has regarded human life and the quality of life of the individual as special. It has been common to speak of the sanctity of human life. I think one of the main obstacles to learning and defending <clears throat> our pro-life view is the attitude that abortion is a complicated issue. And because we feel that it's a complicated issue, we hesitate to have a conversation with the intent of changing the mind of a pro-choice person. We feel safe when we're talking about abortion among ourselves, but we don't feel as safe when we're talking about it among those who disagree with us. We feel safe when we're talking about it uh, among ourselves, when we're posting our, uh, our uh, pro-life uh, bumper stickers, when we're holding our signs at, at our pro-life rallies. And there's nothing wrong with these things. These things are good. You're showing your unity. You're showing your solidarity with defending the unborn by doing these things. However, it's not very likely that a bumper sticker or holding a sign at a rally is going to persuade anybody. You're not going to persuade someone who's driving by in their car and they see you holding a sign. You're not going to persuade anybody who's watching the evening news coverage on the rally that you had that afternoon. If you're going to convince that the pro-life position is the morally and scientifically right position, then that's going to require a person-to-person -person conversation. In other words, changing the other person's mind. So, in this series, we're going to learn how to articulate the main issue. What is the main issue? Not only that, how to keep the conversation on, focused on the main issue. In other words, you need to control the direction of the conversation. If you allow the other person to control the conversation and you get off the path and you get out there in the weeds somewhere, everything is going to become muddled, confused, and convoluted. You want to remember two things here. Number one, how to articulate the main issue. In other words, how to stay on the path. And number two, how to keep the conversation focused on the main issue. Stay out of the weeds. Well, the main issue revolves around a question. It revolves around a question that you're not going to ask the person one time. You're going you're gonna to ask this person two or three or four or five or six times this question. You're going to keep coming back to this question. This is part of staying on the path. Do not allow the person that you're talking with ignore the question. Well, what is the question? Here it is. What is it? That's the main issue. What is it? What is the unborn? Is the unborn a human person? You see, the issue is not about choice. It's not about health. It's not about privacy. It's not about focusing or, or rather forcing religion or moral, your morality on someone else. It's not about any of those things. Those are topics that get you out in the weeds. When you're, t when you're focusing on health, when you're focusing on choice and privacy and so on, then you're out in the weeds. The focus is on the question, what is it? Is it a human person? Is the, if the unborn is a person, then killing him or her is not justified. It is morally wrong. If the unborn is not a person, then killing him or her requires no more justification than it would for going to the dentist and getting a tooth pulled, or squeezing a pimple, or lancing a boil. 
the question, the focus. What is it? That is the issue. If you'll recall in Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, God did two things when he created man. First of all, it says that he formed man out of the dust of the ground. In other words, God formed the substance of man, he, in, in, the material of man. He took the dust of the ground and formed it into a person, into a, into a human body. The stuff that makes the body up, that's what he did. The second thing he did was, it says, he breathed the breath of life into his nostrils. So he took that material that he had formed and he breathed the breath of life into it and the non-living material became a living person. It's interesting in Genesis 1, seven times it says that we see this formula, and God said. And God said, and there were plants. And then there were trees. And then there was all kinds of vegetation. All these things happened after God said. Again, God said, and there were living creatures in the water, on the land, and in the sky. The pattern was the same, and God said. But the formula changed. Everything changed when God created man. It says in Genesis 2, 7, then the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground. He formed man with his hands, as it were, like a potter molds and forms a lump of clay. He created the creatures, as it were, from a distance. And God said, and they appeared over here. And God said, and things appeared over here. So he created them from a distance. But he made man up close and personal. He breathed into the nostril, his nostrils, the breath of life, and man became a living being, a person made in the image of God. That is what distinguishes man from everything else. You see, there's a similarity between God and man. Not identical, it's a similarity. Man has God-like qualities. He resembles God. He's more God-like than animal-like. Man has an eternal spirit. That's, and that spirit doesn't cease to exist when his body dies. Man has the capacity and capability of forming relationships with other people and even God. Man is self-conscious. Animals are not. Man is self-reflective. Man has moral discernment. These are godlike qualities. In Genesis chapter 9, verse 6, it says, it talks about killing, and it condemns the killing of another person. And it gives the reason. It says, thou shalt not kill. It doesn't say, because of the dignity of man, it doesn't say that. It says, thou shalt not kill because, here it is, man is made in the image of God. That's why you shouldn't kill another person. In other words, to kill another person is to deface the image of God in that person. It's, it's killing uh, a creature that resembles God. It's killing God in effigy. You see, the whole focus of that verse is on God. You shouldn't kill because, the focus is on God, man is made in the image of God. Historically, the term non-person or non-human, has been used to justify all kinds of prejudice and cruelty. For example, Nazi concentration camps, all right? Uh, all over the world, slavery is practiced. Uh, human trafficking, all these are dehumanizing people. You can add abortion to that. Because you see, the child in the womb is not considered to be a human person. So, the main assumption 
of, abor of, of abortion advocates today is that the unborn is not a human person. Y'all remember Paul in Romans chapter 1, he talked about how sin has corrupted man's thinking. That man's heart is twisted away from God and man is bent toward uh, self-interests and desires. Paul said man suppresses the truth and denying the personhood of the unborn is an example of that. Advocates of abortion point out that the word abortion is not in the Bible. As I studied abortion and, and some of the arguments about it, that, that always came up, it seemed like. That was one of their big, uh, uh, their defense of abortion uh, for Christians is abortion is not in the Bible. Mark Bigelow, a member of the Clergy Advisory Board of Planned Parenthood, amazing they have an, a, a clergy advisory board, um, listen to what he said. He said, quote, Jesus never said a word about abortion. If the Bible does not condemn abortion, pro-lifers should not condemn abortion. Now, I think the fallacy of that argument is, is, is very obvious. Just because the Bible doesn't specifically forbid or condemn something doesn't mean God condones something. The Bible doesn't specifically condemn genocide, in other words, the killing of large groups of people. But we can't come to the conclusion that Jesus condones genocide. The Bible doesn't specifically say you shouldn't kill your toddler, or you shouldn't kill your mailman, or you shouldn't kill your, your husband or wife or your butcher. But we can't conclude that Jesus condones killing your mailman, butcher, your wife, or your toddler. You see, here's how they reply to that. They'll say something like this. Well, there's a difference between a toddler and the unborn. The difference is a toddler is a human person. You see, you're forced to go back to the question, what is it? What is it? Well, they say, it is not a human person. And in a later lecture, I'm going to talk about the difference because they do say it's a human being, but they say it's not a human person, and they make a distinction there. We'll get into that later. You see, the fact of the matter is the Bible does condemn killing a toddler. It does condemn killing your mailman, your butcher, your, your, uh, your plumber, or your, your spouse. It condemns those things by condemning homicide. Homicide is killing a person. The Bible condemns killing an innocent person. A toddler, killing a toddler or your mailman is morally wrong to kill. That's why the abortion debate is about, or, or whether the, that's why the abortion debate is not about choice or health or privacy or morality or anything like that. It's about what is it. If the unborn is a person, it is morally wrong to kill it. Just as it is morally wrong to kill your mailman, your butcher, your wife, your husband. Just as it's morally wrong to kill any innocent person. You see, Abortion can only be justified if it is not a person. So, the idea that abortion is a complicated issue really is not, really is not true. It is morally wrong to intentionally kill any innocent human person. Abortion is the intentional killing of a human person. Abortion is morally wrong. Now, a pro-abortion person would say, one of their arguments is, well, legalized abortion prevents women from dying in back alley abortions. Well, as a pro-lifer, I would say, this makes sense only if the unborn is not a human person. In other words, to save the life of mother, they say, 
who wants to illegally abort their child in an alley. We are going to legalize abortion by calling that child a non-person. So, in order to save the life of a mother who is a person, we, we will legalize abortion. In other words, we are right back to the question, what is it? Because if it's not a person, then legalizing abortion is, is not morally wrong. Um, so, I, I, I found that a good pro-life strategy as you're, as you're speaking to someone is to, and when they make certain arguments or objections, is compare the unborn with a toddler. For example, an abortion advocate may say something like, well, some women in having a child or having another child, that will bring on her a lot of financial problems. And so my argument would be, so killing an unborn is justified because of financial, because, of, because a person may have a financial burden, right? And then you ask, would that justify killing a toddler? Again, bring that toddler out, all right? And of course, here's going to be their reply. Their reply is, no, I wouldn't kill a toddler. A toddler is a human person made in the image of God. Of course, the question is, is, wait a minute, when does the image of God in this personhood happen? Well, that's another convoluted uh, idea, and we'll, we'll talk about that later. So, in other words, we're right back to the question, what is it? What is it? An abortion advocate argues, it's about a woman's right to choose. Well, the pro-lifer would ask the question, well, is it your right to choose to kill a toddler? And of course, they're going to say, well, no, a toddler is a human person. Again, you're right back to the question, what is it? You see, you got to stay on the question. So, in these and many other examples, the abortion advocate always assumes the unborn is not a person. You want to learn how to articulate the main issue as well as how to keep the conversation focused on the main issue. Control the direction of the conversation. It's not about choice, it's not about health, it's you need to guide the conversation. Help them to see. It's all about answering the question, what is it? And remember two things, how to articulate the main issue, stay on the path, and number two, how to keep the conversation focused on the main issue, stay out of the weeds.